the trip over was grueling and uh, not lonely, but just kind of odd, you know, kind of very odd. Uh, not with, I think I probably, there were some people from the plane on Guam to Da Nang, uh, but again, I, I knew nobody. And was it too loud in the plane really to try to talk to anybody? No, yeah, you couldn't have talked to anybody in that big, whatever it was, C-140 or 52, whatever. Well, I don't even know what it was, but you couldn't talk. It was too loud. So when you're making your way from, first you go from the Bay Area in California to Guam, and then Guam to Da Nang, is that the... Correct, right. So when you're in the air from... Guam to Da Nang, and here we're talking about ladder 68, so the Tet Offensive is behind us. Right. Um, I mean, this is really the most intense part of the war. Um, uh, what's your own disposition? What's your own thinking as you're in the air from, you know, between Guam and Da Nang? You know, just looking back, um, and I understand we're talking about deck something that happened decades ago, but as you reflect back on that, what was your own disposition about, you know, where I'm going and what I'm going to be doing? You know, I, I, I was just, I wasn't uh, afraid. Actually, I was invigorated because this is what I had trained to do to go fly, and I wanted to fly in that environment because. You're young and that's what you want to do. You know, you want to, you just want to be involved in that kind of an endeavor. I didn't even know much about Vietnam. When I went into the Marine Corps and when I went through flight school, I knew it was there, but that wasn't even in my consciousness thinking about that's where I was going to go. I mean, I knew it, but I never even thought about it hmm. until we got probably to, uh, Santa Ana, California, where we did advanced combat training. Then, obviously, you know that's what you're going to do. Um, but I had no real, I wasn't really educated about what was going on over there. I, I really didn't know. I just knew that we were going to Vietnam and there was a war and I was going to take part in it. Wow. But I had very little specifics of what that was all about. In fact, I don't even knew that I knew Tet had happened when I got there. Suppose somebody, let's say you're you're an hour out from Da Nang, and you know another officer on the plane asks you, you know, why are we why are we even going to Vietnam? What's the what's the point of this? Um, what do you suppose you might have said at the time? I probably would have said I have no idea because I didn't have any idea. I mean, it wasn't. It, it was kind. Of, it was surreal in the sense that I really didn't know what was going to happen or what I was going to do or what the dangers might be. Um, it, it, I know it sounds odd, but it was kind of like you're just, it, it was all so new and I had no background about it. I was just kind of along for the ride in a way. Wow. Well, let's jump ahead then. Let's say six months later. Now you've spent a lot of time in the air as a as a helicopter pilot with the Marine Corps. You've seen a lot. I imagine you've changed. I imagine things you've experienced in those first six months are with you to this day. Suppose as that helo is winding up and you're getting ready for a mission six months halfway through your tour, so six and a half months um, after you arrive, suppose you're co-pilot asked you the same question why are we here what are we doing here what is what is this all about what do you suppose you would have said at that point i probably would have said the same thing i have no idea what we're doing here because i knew i mean when i first got there and i flew a few missions with guys that had been there on that were there now on their second tour and we were flying in and out, and they would tell me, we're flying in and out of the same zones we were before, you know, because the policy was not to take territory, but to go out, um, seek and destroy and come back to the same bases we held. There was no progress of any kind in terms of the war effort that we that I could see or that any of my other co or pilots could see. We're just you know, delivering the mail, so to speak, every day, but nothing really changes. 
So then what motivates you to keep going? You've got a very dangerous job. Um, you know, you, it's a, every day you're, yeah. you know, you got the NBA, you got the VC, you've got the possibility of mechanical failures, you've got weather. Um, it's a very dangerous job. So I'm hearing you say that if a co-pilot says, what are we doing here? The response is basically, I don't know, because you didn't say this, but I'm picking up from what you're saying. The way we're prosecuting this war doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so what does motivate you then day after day to get back into that helicopter and to do this dangerous work? Well, because we are support for those Marines on the ground. And that's our job. And they're my Marines. So there is a sense of commitment when you're a Marine that you do whatever that job requires you to do. And there's not much argument about it. You may question sometimes the, the intelligence of the missions you're on, but you don't, it does not affect your, your determination to make that, to do the job you're called on to do that job, especially when uh, everybody's, uh, many, many lives depend on you doing your job properly. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, a, you know, a primary, the primary motivation is, um, I don't know if this is the right verb, but serving those Marines who are out in the field. Absolutely. Who need to be supplied, who need to be medevaced. There were places Absolutely. Need to come in. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 it, it, the reason for the war, the purpose for the war had nothing to do with how, what we thought or how we how we performed every day never it just didn't it wasn't part of the equation well it fits with what you know i've heard so many times from veterans you ask well you know what was the war about and what i've heard so many times is the war was about the guy next to me and me the, yep. war, the war had about a diameter of about 10 feet at any given that's moment. About, no. um and that's what it was about i trust the guy next to me the guy next to me trust me and our job is to help each other get home. That's right. And that's what exactly what it is. When you set foot um, in Da Nang on the tarmac there, what is your first impression of this place? <laughs> it smelled horrible. Yeah. And I'll talk, I, I guarantee you there, are, if you talk that what you have, of course, they'll all tell you the same thing. You get off the plane, you go, what is that odor? And to say, well, they're they're burning the they're burning shit, you know. There 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 is no sewage system here, so all that um, human waste they, they burn it in big fifty half a fifty gallon drums. And you know, there used to be poor guys. You know, when I was in Fubai, whoever or private or sergeant, usually a corporal or a private. Yeah. got sideways with a sergeant. That was their job. They got to do the honey bucket brigade and they got to go out there and pour jet fuel on 55 gallon drums full of crap and burn them, stir it and burn them and stir it and burn them. Nice job. And that's what it felt. That was the first impression and the heat and the humidity. When the siren goes off or usually the, the first rocket hits and you would before the siren go off, you know, it's like, oh, there's the siren. Well, we already know it. So we would, there were bunkers next to each of our hooches. We lived in these Quonset huts at one point. And between each was a set of bunkers. And we would all bail out of the Quonset hut and get in the bunker and wait till the uh, rocket attack was over. And um, in, what, in, this, in this one case, the rocket hit right next to us and blew up the hooch. Uh, right kind of catty corner across from us. And um, we, a, a buddy of mine, we crawled out because I thought, you know, somebody's probably in that. And we went over to see if there was anybody in it. And the rocket, had, the siren hadn't all clear, hadn't gone, but it was over. And there was a guy in there, he was a major, and he would always crawl under his bunk rather than go to the bunker. He just didn't think he needed to go to the bunker. The rocket that went into that hooch went right through his bunk and embedded itself 
in the concrete pad. And to this day, I, I remember distinctly, it had banana peeled out. So part of the rocket was still sticking in the pad. And on the side of it, there you could see CCCP 122 MM. And that really brought home the war in the sense that, hey, we're not just fighting you know, the North Vietnamese, this is Russia. There it is, right there. That was the and we were standing the there Soviet looking. Union, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And here comes the major walking down the path between the two hooches. <laughs> he was covered in shit. He had been sitting on the two-holer a couple of hooches down when the rocket hit, and it blew the two-holer over and him in it. And... um so we, mm, yeah, <laughs> it was, and I think I said, I said, holy shit, Major, are you all right? And I went, oh, that's not the right thing to say. Yeah, right. And it was all we could do to keep from, he, he goes, Gay Waller, I heard that, you son of a bitch. You better never fucking see me you again. Anyway, it was, it was pretty yeah. comical. <laughs> it's one of those stories that, you know, could have ended up not being funny, but. Oh, that's right. That, I mean, that that it would have pierced him. Had he gone under the. Bracket would have gone right through him. He was lucky. Yeah, so I, I guess the moral of that story is he was lucky to be sitting on on the in the latrine um, and right. deal with that rather than to be where where he. Yeah, I guess you could say he was lucky as shit. <laughs> I, he probably wouldn't want to hear that, but no, he probably would not. True. You know the war's going on, but and the first, you know, you don't fly right away. You're you're probably getting organized for a, a week, maybe, before you actually go out on your first flight um, of, a, of any meaning. And it's that first flight uh, out of the base, into the, into the jungle, into the rice paddies. Um, and you sit down and you look over and there's three or four body bags over there or there's wounded you're taking out or whatever it is. It, it isn't necessarily, the first, it's not being under fire the first time, it's that. You, Usually you don't get shot at the first time you go out. Um, yeah. But it's just seeing the, you know, the results of what may have happened yesterday to those four bastards. Yeah. And I'm guessing that, you know, you just repeat those words, the body bags. I'm guessing when you hear that, you can bring right to your mind images, um, things that you I can see. Them, I can see them like it was yesterday. You've already answered this question a bit, um, but, you know, let's say in a three month period, what different kinds of missions would you fly? Oh, just about everything. You would fly uh, inserts, taking troops into the field, uh, resupplying them with whatever, uh, medevac missions where you would bring wounded Marines out. Uh, there are two kinds of extracts. There were what they call um, can you remember? But routine meant you were taking body bags out. Um, there would be recon inserts. The ones that's the ones probably the most dangerous and extracts, and some admin runs. You know, sometimes it was a milk run for the day. Now taking out these recon, these reconnaissance marines, is that are we're basically talking about something like the LERPs, the long range reconnaissance patrol guys? Yes. Right. That these are Marines. And well, yeah. why did you say that, that that is a particularly, can be a particularly dangerous operation? Because, well, they would send these guys out in groups of six or anywhere, six to 10 at some point, and they would put them out in really bad, in bad country. And that was to find the enemy and then to report back so that they could, the operations people could determine what they, how they wanted to go after these guys. They were always outnumbered and they were always in contact. <laughs> so putting them in might be one thing, but getting them out was always dangerous. Very dangerous. Imagine sometimes. sometimes these extracts are taking place with these recon Marines um, while they're under fire. Absolutely. As I get ready to ask this question, I know that it's not something that you're not really going to be able to put into words. Um, it always amazes me when we're talking about young people. What are you, about 22, 23, something like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, a really young person operating a very complicated machine in extremely stressful circumstances. Um, not only are you, you want to get these Marines on that helo as quickly as you can, they're under fire, but you're under fire. And so the, the question is, um, you know, to someone who's never experienced anything remotely like that, what is going on with you that makes it possible to get this done, to operate this complicated machine under extremely stressful circumstances? What, you know, what skills, what abilities are required to do that? Because I think the vast majority of people thinking about themselves would say, I don't think I would be able to do that. Um, but what is required to get that done? Well, first of all, you got to be a good pilot, obviously. You got to be able to fly that aircraft. Is, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're, you're operating on a razor's edge, but you've trained to do this. You know how to do this. Surely you get better and better at it. Um, but you know when you're going in to, uh, let's say, a hot LZ or pulling recon guys out, you don't really have a choice, you know? There, there isn't like, oh, I'm scared and I'm not going to do this. Mm -hmm. You're you're not scared. You're just on razor's edge, you know? You're just, every fiber of your focus is on what you're doing. And so you really don't have time. You, you, may, you may have some difficult moments, but it's usually afterwards. Maybe that night or something, but when while you're doing it, and... you can't, you can't, you, you, you have to be totally focused 100%. And that focus keeps all the fear and, and what ifs away from you, at least in my experience. Right. So, you know, over the years, I've asked veterans, you know, what were you thinking in a situation like this? And the answer always is nothing. You're That's not right. Thinking about anything. You're not thinking about anything. I'm just thinking about how I can get my aircraft. I'm, I'm thinking about technically, how, how am I going to get this aircraft to do what I needed to do? And, you know, you know, how do I get in? How do I get out? I want to ask you, Link, what you just said to something you, you write in your memoir. And you say that, you know, for all of the terrible things you saw in Vietnam and all the terrible things you experienced in Vietnam, there's something about it that you miss. And you've heard, I've heard this so many times from veterans who will say something seemingly so contradictory as um, Vietnam was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And there are, there are things about it that I miss intensely. Um, yeah. Is that what you're just describing? You're describing a young man who is operating a very complicated machine who is, in the case of extraction, under fire, getting these Marines out of a dangerous situation, the intensity of it, the focus of it, the importance of it, is that the kind of stuff that you think about when you say that there's something about that experience in Vietnam that you miss? It's the adrenaline rush. There's a... It, it, You're never going to. You're never going to experience that again. There's nothing that can compare to the, that experience in those situations. And uh, it's like, wow, that it's hard to explain, but it. I, I guess the best words are it's you become an adrenaline junkie. There are a lot of guys that came back afterwards and what do they do? The first thing they do is buy a motorcycle. So they go as fast as they can go because they, they miss that adrenaline rush that can't, you can't find it any other way. Flying in combat is, is especially in a helicopter in combat is, is, is as much of an adrenaline rush as I know that you can find anywhere. And so it, it, it kind of seeps into your, your being and, uh, and you become somewhat addicted to it. Is it also the sense that of just the intense importance of what you're doing? I mean, what we're doing right now really, really, really matters. There's no question about it. This is really important what I'm doing right now. 
Absolutely. And, you know, helicopter pilots are going in and doing these things. They're saving lives. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you know, where else are you going to get that experience? And you don't get, to, you do it more than once. You do it multiple, multiple times. You know, I mean, you're not saving lives when you're taking these poor bastards and dumping them in a rice paddy. But you are when you go back and pick them up. A lot of officers that are in the ground are a couple of officers and maybe 30, 40 enlisted men. We're in a squadron where they're all officers for the most part. I mean, we were all pilots. Certainly we had crew chiefs and, you know, and, uh, and door gunners and maintenance people and that kind of support stuff. Yeah. But it was like a college fraternity in the sense that we all just, and we were pretty blasé about it. Um, even after, you know, if you, if you, you maybe were almost didn't come back, but you did come back. Um, the only time we weren't blasé about it is when we lost friends, obviously, other pilots. Um, but it was kind of like a, just young guys that thought their shit didn't stink and that they could do anything. And so that's kind of how we flew. We didn't fly scared. We fly prepared and with focus and with commitment. When a pilot was lost and that, you know, that, has an impact on what you're describing as kind of a you know fraternity um what do you do with that i mean i i the name is said maybe whatever information there is is shared and then there's a couple minutes where you maybe think about that and then and then what is it just something you just have to put away and let go so that you can just focus on the next mission oh no usually if uh you know, you heard about somebody that didn't come back that day. Um, we drank a lot. Let's put it that way. Um, every day, I'll tell you, we went to the Oak Club after we flew and we drank. And um, and we cried. And, you know, we, we had to somehow, um, you know, process that loss. But you can't let it cripple you because you still have to go fly tomorrow. And um, sometimes they give you a day off or two, maybe depending on how close, it, you know, the loss was, but, you know, you still had to go fly and you still had to just, you know, that's why they, you know, we pigeonholed it. We just put it up in a pigeonhole and let it sit there. Maybe 40 years later, it'd show up. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing um, it's easy for you, you know, as I mentioned, these Marines, you know, you're 22, you're 23. In that context, you're going to seem somewhat ancient. Uh, you've got a lot of 18 and 19 year olds that you're that you're putting into the field. Um, yeah. you think about those Marines. You can see them out your windshield. Um, you can see them coming to the helo. Um, just talk about those those 18, 19 year old Marines that you're inserting extracting what thoughts do you have about them well you know people you'd always you, know, you tell someone would tell me or find out that i was you know a helicopter pilot in vietnam and they go holy shit you know what you're a hero and i go no The arrows were those 18 and 19 year olds that we had to put in the bush that sat out there for weeks at a time. Their clothes rotten off of them, sometimes low on food, water, ammunition. I got to go home every night or back to the base every night. I slept in a bed. They did not. And they were at risk all the time out there. I was at risk some of the time out there. So, I mean, yeah, I have the utmost respect for one of the missions you flew, um, you've got some rock forces in your in your helo, and you you write yeah. about this in your in your memoir. Now, you hear different things. Well, what you hear from 
all American vets who had some experience with the Republic of Korea forces, you know, you hear words like tough, ruthless, they didn't play games, they didn't have to play by the same rules we played by. Right. And you certainly describe that. And some vets will say, and, you know, that's how that war was. And if there had been more of that, then, you know, maybe the, the war would have uh, gone a different way. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not sure we want to throw away the rules of war. Um, but, you know, you understand maybe why why some folks would say, you know, the rocks did it did it right. But there's no question that the rocks didn't operate according to the same rules we did. And you knew that um, when you've got these Korean forces getting onto your helo. Can you just tell that story of what happened with these uh, Korean Korean guys you had on your helo? You know, most of the time when we would go down there, <clears throat> uh, they were just in an uh, area of responsibility south of Da Nang. And uh, we would, every once in a while, your mission was to go down and, you know, be support for them. Most of the time, we didn't do anything or we would fly them to the PX so they could load up on electrical gear and send it home or sit around and watch movies. Uh, the reason they didn't go out much is because when they did go out, you know, the VC did not want to venture into their territory because they knew they get caught, they were toast. Um, and so there wasn't much action in that area uh, because they were so afraid of them. The VC was uh, but occasionally of the Koreans. Afraid of the Korean, yeah, the South right. Koreans. And they were tough sons of bitches. I'm telling you, they were the baddest of the bad. And uh, they're mean and ruthless is exactly what they were. And, but on one occasion, we went out and they had captured, uh, I think, three of them, as I remember. We we're flying them back. And I had heard these stories. And uh, my crew chief goes, uh, Lieutenant, I think they're getting ready to throw one of these guys out the door. Yeah, the Koreans said, are getting ready to throw one of the Viet Cong One of the VC guys out the door. As I remember, I said, uh, you take out your 45 and you point it at that son of a bitch and you tell him if he throws him out, you're going to shoot him. He goes, sir, he knows I'm not going to shoot him. I said, I know, but that's what you're going to do anyway. And I don't want you to shoot him, but we have to try. He said, sir, he just threw him out the door. How, how, so I how, said, how high would you say you were? How oh, high you probably 1,500, 2,500 feet. Yeah. And um, so I know I said something like, son of a fucking bitch. I said, you take that weapon and you point it at the other VC and you tell him if he throws that one out, he's gonna sh you're going to shoot the other one. Because I know they threw the one guy out, so the other two are going to talk, right? I mean, that's the whole idea. Get into and, um, and if we eliminate, if he throws one out, we shoot the other one, then they have nothing. So um, they, we got back. And uh, nothing else happened, and we landed, and uh, you know they they got out, and uh, they the whoever the guy was in in the belly that was the head, a rock, uh, looked up at me, and he grinned, you know, and he goes like this, and I told him, you know, I gave him the fucking bird, and I frank the helicopter up as uh, as as much as I could, so I could blow as much dust and dirt over that son of a bitch as I could. And, um, you know, that was it. I reported to the CO when we got back and he said, yeah, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, they don't, we're not, they're not American soldiers. They belong to a different country and, you know, they play by their own rules, like you said. Yeah. But it was, you know, it's still, you, you still feel responsible. It's my bird, God damn it. You know, and I don't, that shit happened. And it's, there wasn't anything we could do about it, but you still feel responsible in some way. What is your response to the soldier? And we remember the context here. I mean, the Viet Cong, especially, you know, with all of their traps and you don't know who's friend or foe. And, you know, they're they're smiling at you on the base while they're working in the barbershop. And then it turns out they're a sapper. You know, you find out he, the same guy's working for the VC. So let's let's just set up a, a scenario where this happens and you're relating this and, and, you know, and another officer says, you know, why are you bothered about that? I mean, you know, who cares if they throw the, the VC out of the heel or not, given what the, the VC have done to our guys? What what would you have said at that time? Because it's murder. 
and they're not they're not trying to defend themselves against anybody. Uh, they're not under attack by this guy. His hands are bound. They they murdered him, and they, and in a pretty horrible way. That's the difference. Yeah. Roughly how many missions, do you have an idea of how many missions you flew all together um, in your, during your tour in South Vietnam? I would say about 130 to 40, somewhere in that area. Okay. Yeah. But that 130 to 40 missions that you fly, um, I wonder if there are one or two that especially stand out in your memory. I imagine a lot of the missions just sort of meld together and, you know, kind of become a, a kind of a blob. But I, but I imagine there are other missions, though, that very distinctly stand out in your memory. You just described one, I think, um, this experience with the Korean forces. Um, are there one or two other specific missions that do stand out, especially in your memory? Well, this is good, not going to be easy for me. Being when we went into Hill Eight, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, but being shot down was not was probably the most mm -hmm. the one that I remember the most. Um, and losing my co-pilot. Were you, was this an uh, an insert mission or an extract mission? No, we were just going, taking some <clears throat> troops into a hill called Hill 818. And uh, near, it was... Near Quezon. Uh, huh? Near Quezon? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, most, every, you know, I flew all my time out of Fubai, which is in i -Corps, which is in the northern part of the country. And right. most of our missions were in that sector. A lot of up around the DMZ, Quezon, Camp Carroll, those kind of places, Rock Powell. And, um, you know, we uh, got, we were under fire when we were going in there. And, uh, you know, the rotor blade or the uh, tail rotor got damaged and we went into a spin and we crashed into the, into, on the side of the, on the on the concertina wire on the perimeter of the of the LZ, and uh, you know, didn't go well. Everybody in the aircraft got out except the co-pilot. Roughly, what what elevation was the Hilo at when it was hit? Oh, we were probably only a hundred feet over over the LZ, okay. maybe maybe a little more than that, probably maybe three, 400 feet over the LZ coming in. And did you have any control at all? Not once the tail rotor is damaged. What happens, the tail rotor actually keeps the helicopter because the rotor head goes like this. So the tendency is for the helicopter to spin around the opposite way under it. And the tail rotor keeps that from happening. Once you lose your tail rotor, then you have no control really, other than you're spinning. You can you can you can you can settle the aircraft if you're lucky enough, but you're settling it in a spin. So, and uneven ground and stuff, you know, you're you're pretty much screwed. Yeah. How many were on the Hilo at the time? Oh, I'm going to guess there were probably, well, we had myself, co pilot, crew chief, gunner, and probably four, because that's all that aircraft could handle, uh, especially at altitude. So the the Hilo impacts, and then, then what happens? It's just the process of finding out how everyone on the Hilo is. Yeah, we were laying on our side, and uh, I I looked down and I could see Dave, and he had what looked like a piece of metal stuck in his neck, and um, there's blood all over him. 
So I climb out and um, there's an, and there, you know, there's rounds going off and some corporal comes over and I told him we had to help get Dave out. And, uh, and he jumped up and got down in there under fire. And somehow, I don't know how the hell he drug him out of there, but he did. And then he lowered him down, you know, to the side in the meantime. Other people, other guys in, in the LZ were getting the, the um, I think those were recon guys we were putting in. I think they were supposed to go out the next day, as I remember, on a, they were pulling them out of the belly of the aircraft. So everybody else was kind of scrambling and scrambling, scrambling, trying to get out. Yeah. It's on its side. So you got to get up out of the door and you're kind of cl climbing out, out. And uh, so they, that corporal, or I think he was a corporal. I got Dave out and kind of slid him down the side to some guys that picked him, carried him over to the out of the out of fire. It's about as much as I do remember, because it's you know you're kind of your 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 mind's really scrambled at that point. You don't you're not thinking very clearly about anything. You know it's it's you're in shock is what you are really. I mean you, what you are not. In, you're not paralyzed in shock, but you are. How long was it after that until you were back in the air? That's a good question. I don't know. Probably a number of days. Yeah. Is that because you you know, were slightly injured yourself or just that's just how it worked out or your officer, your yeah. commanding officer just thought we're going to give this guy some downtime? I think that's probably the latter is probably good. We can give you a couple of days off, regroup. Yeah. You know, I wasn't injured. I'm, I don't know how I wasn't, but I wasn't. So you're you're flying out of Fubai and you're doing a lot of missions there in Northern i -Corps. Um around uh, the rock pile and caisson and that and here we're in we're in um mostly we're in 69 what memories do you have of caisson at that time not a whole lot um it was it was just an i mean well it wasn't under fire you know it, that that had already happened so it was just like going into most bases other than the fact that the the runway was on the side of each, each side of the runway was littered with 46, you know, uh, H-46s and C-130s that had been um, trying to get in there. In the so it was pretty dramatic visually. I mean, there was no danger there. It wasn't like, you know, going into anything that was hot. There was, but that visual is that that, that brought it home as to what had gone on there. And when you read about that, which I have obviously, but right. uh, it was freaking pretty intense shit. A lot of just the, the helos that had been shot down and they're just sort of laying out there. Yeah. Suppose that for some reason you had to give up all of your memories of your tour in Vietnam, except for one. Um, what memory, if you could only keep one, what memory of your tour in Vietnam would you keep? Um, as odd as it may sound, I would keep the memory of Ron Janicek Hauser, my roommate who we lost. Uh, he was really, we were very close. He and Pete and I were kind of the three musketeers and the, they told me he had been killed uh, was the hardest day I had over there. And you might think I'd want to give that up, but I don't. What is it about that that you would, that you hang on to? What good friends we were. How much fun we had together. Oh, we're always laughing, always joking. Um, he was just a really great guy and and uh, you know I don't know I'm never going to figure 
he was out on a mission. Uh, there was a major flying his aircraft and he was a co-pilot and they were out to try and uh, pick up some guys that were in contact, heavy contact in this kind of ravine. And um, the lead aircraft had flown over this area and he radioed to Ron's pilot, the major, not to fly over that particular ridge line because they had just received a lot of heavy fire off of that. Mm -hmm. For some reason, he did, and the aircraft was hit and uh, caught on fire. And Ron's last words, he was screaming, I'm on fire, I'm on fire, I'm on fire. So they crashed into the riverbed and uh and the let's see the second uh I, don't, I have to remember the details of this but one of the uh crew the he, uh, ron must have been thrown out of the aircraft because the crew chief the, the pilot was alive the crew chief was alive and the gunner was alive and one of them jumped into the river to try and get, to see if he could save Hauser or find him. And he drowned, or they never found him either. And then a, there was a, the South Vietnamese flew the H-34, the, my, this aircraft, and they're called um, King Bees. And uh, they are, some of those pilots were unbelievable. They, they, they flew around in like plaid shirts and jeans and cowboy boots, and <laughs> but they were some, freaking great pilots and this pilot flew down still under fire and hooked his skid into the window of the aircraft and lifted it out of the water to see if Hauser was in it you gotta be kidding me uh, but he wasn't and um, they never found him He's, his remains are still over there somewhere that's the other thing he didn't get to come home even in a bag They went back twice, twice, I think, to try and see if they could uh, recover bodies, but the the fire was so intense they had to call off the search and twice, I think, and uh, so they never did recover them. I'm thinking of a young man I know who has been in the Marine Corps now for just oh, I think four or five months, something like that. He's at the beginning of his first enlistment, um, and he's a so he's a young Marine. What do you what do you have to say to him? Uh, you're part of one of the greatest organizations in the history of the military. And uh, read the history of of the Marine Corps. Understand where they've been, what they've done, and the kind of the kind of stature that people that they hold and the way people look at it as the United States Marine. Uh, they called them in World War I in the Battle of, I think the Aragon Fathers, devil dogs, because they were just ferocious and they never gave up and they fight to the last man. It's a warrior breed. You know, you're just not wearing any uniform. You're wearing the uniform of a Marine. You have the responsibility to uphold the honor of that organization and the history that it uh, that it has established through through all those years. <laughs>